All right, everyone, we've got about 40 people on between both of our platforms, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. David Kleiman, um, who's giving us a talk about colonoscopy and colorectal practice, the good, the bad, and the essential. He's a staff surgeon in the Division of Colorectal Surgery at Leahy Hospital. Um, in Burlington, Massachusetts, and holds an academic position um, at Tufts. He's a native of New Jersey, completed uh, his BA and MD program at Rutgers and Robert Wood Johnson, and then did general surgery residency at New York Presbyterian Cornell Medical Center, and then his fellowship um, at New York Presbyterian Cornell um, and uh, MSK. He then joined the staff at Leahy in 2017, and he currently serves as the director of robotic colorectal surgery and also so is the program director of the NAPRC initiative. He's a very active member of ASCARS and presents, uh, currently serves as the vice chair of the Young Surgeons Committee um, and is a member of several other committees as well. Clinical interests include colorectal cancer, diverticulitis, IBD, robotic and laparoscopic colorectal surgery, and advanced endoscopic resection. Um, this is an amazing talk that he gave last year, and I'm so pleased to have him on our platform. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Good evening, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I was I was thrilled to get the invitation to participate in this series. Um, this series has been uh, something that I have always deeply admired from the outset. I think this this always uh, has felt like one of the uh, shining uh, lights that has come out of the dark days of the COVID pandemic. Um, when my friend and now partner John Abelson and and Olga, who I um, Olga Garcia, I see is on here. Um, when they first started this a couple of years ago, uh, it's been great to see that although things are getting back to some semblance of normal now that this series is still alive and strong. Um, and uh, I know you've uh, been able to get a great lineup of speakers in the past and it's truly an honor to be asked to participate in it. Um, so we are going to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart um, that the people who have worked with us, uh, some of this will look familiar. Raga, I see your name there. Good to see you here. A lot of this will sound familiar with you, and Mike has had the um, misfortune of having to spend his first two months of his fellowship uh, with me, uh, where uh, we worked pretty hard on learning a lot of the principles that we're going to talk about. Um, so as was mentioned, this talk originated with a, talk, with a panel talk that I was asked to give at ASCARS last year. Um, and But that's only the first half of what we're doing today. The second half I created for tonight. Uh, which is more of a focus on sort of how to integrate colonoscopy into your practice. Um, so the, the talk will sort of have two different feels or two parts. One will be sort of a practical guide, a tips and tricks kind of a guide of the way I think about colonoscopy and some very practical uh, pieces of advice that hopefully you'll be able to bring to your institutions. And then the second half will be more about how do you integrate that into your practice to make it the best practice it can be. Uh, I do have these disclosures. None of them are relevant to this topic for tonight. Uh, so we're going to start by first defining the problem, and I'll use this sort of a case-based way with a couple of real case examples from my practice, actually just within the last couple of weeks. And then we'll talk about why colonoscopy is so darn hard. Why is it that this remains one of the things that just troubles us so much? And then I'll talk to you about what I call my difficult colonoscopy toolbox, um, and then we'll integrate into how you can use colonoscopy to take the best possible care of your patients. So first, let's talk about this poll results. Any of you who are on Twitter may have seen this pop up a couple of days ago. In preparation for tonight, I thought it was kind of curious. I thought it would be interesting to see a little cross-sectional survey of uh, colonoscopy out there in the colorectal world. So my first question that I put out on Twitter was, do you have easy access to a CO2 colonoscope in the OR? I was very pleasantly surprised to see that 90% of respondents said yes, and only 10% said no. That was actually a lot higher than I thought it would be. Do you have flexible sigmoidoscopies with image capture capability in your colorectal clinic? Now, this was a little troublesome to me, but maybe more along the lines of what I expected. Only 39% yes, and 61% said no. And then finally, do you have weekly endoscopic block time? 71% yes, 29% no. It's kind of interesting. So it really seems like there's some, there's some limit to, uh, you know, maybe colonoscopy seeped into the ORs, but maybe not so much to the clinics. All right, so let's talk about the problem here. So why is colonoscopy so important? Well, here's just three real examples of patients of mine, again, from just the last couple of weeks where colonoscopy was really essential in the way that I manage these patients. As I read you these examples, I want you to think to yourself, how would you manage this situation 
if you had unrestricted access to colonoscopy? And then how would you manage it if you did it? Okay, so here's scenario number one. 65 year old female tested positive on Cologuard. Your favorite GI, one who you trust deeply, uh, performed her colonoscopy and found an invasive cancer, quote, just distal to the splenic flexure at 65 centimeters. She tattooed the lesion. You made plans for a laparoscopic left colectomy. You start the case, you put the camera in, and you can't find the tattoo. You're pretty sure of the location because you trust this person very much. Um, so you put in your additional ports and you start to mobilize everything. You peel the omentum off thinking it's going to be under the omentum and you still can't find the tattoo. Now what do you do? This is a scenario that we often talk about, but I found myself in this scenario about a month ago. All right, so let's move on. Number two, 54-year-old male with a history of, quote, colitis 25 years ago. He was on mesalamine for a few years and then was, quote, in remission ever since then. However, his last colonoscopy was 15 years ago when it was, quote, normal. Notice my generous use of quotes here because you can't ever trust what you're being told. Uh, overdue screening colonoscopy was finally done once his wife nudged him enough to go in for his colonoscopy. And he was found to have, quote, moderate inflammation in a continuous fashion beginning in the descending colon, continuing to the cecum. In addition, there was a five centimeter mass in the cecum. Biopsy showed at least intramucosal adenocarcinoma. The sigmoid colon and the rectum were reportedly normal, and he was sent to you to discuss options. So what surgery are you going to offer this patient? And how are you going to decide where your proximal and distal margins are going to be? Um, assuming you might offer him less than a total proctal colectomy. How do you know where you're going to divide and are you confident in that choice? Okay, finally, 67-year-old male, CKD4, sick, sick guy, never had a colonoscopy, developed hematochesia. So his primary care put him in for an urgent colonoscopy. He wound up on your colonoscopy schedule. During the colonoscopy, you found a five-centimeter polyp in the rectum a three centimeter polyp in the mid transverse colon, a two and a half centimeter polyp in the proximal transverse colon and a 15 millimeter polyp in the cecum. All of them looked benign. They looked like either tubular adenomas or tubular villus adenomas, including that giant polyp in the rectum. So what are you gonna do? You're standing there in, in the endoscopy. You have a regular colonoscope in your hand. You didn't plan to do anything else than just a regular colonoscopy. What do you do? Do you do it yourself? Do you refer him somewhere? How are you gonna manage that patient? So again, these aren't hypotheticals. These are actual patients of mine. And so here's some questions that really need to be asked of yourself. So the first one I said before, how would you manage these patients if you had unrestricted access and knew how to use colonoscopies, both pre-op, intraoperatively, and post-op? But then what if someone took that away from you and said, you can't do colonoscopy, you have to rely on gastroenterology or someone else? to do that, then how would you approach these patients? What would you counsel them? How would you go about your surgical planning? So here's some other questions to ask yourself. How often do you rely on what someone else, including a gastroenterologist tells you uh, to look at inside of the colon? How often do you need to depend on what someone else says? You wanna know yourself, so you have to say, hey, what did it look like? If you had unlimited access to colonoscopy, what would you be comfortable doing? How much would you feel confident taking on yourself versus how much would you refer to an advanced endoscopist or a gastroenterology or someone else? And then finally, and I think probably most important for you to the take homes after today is what do you think is keeping you from maximizing your endoscopic potential? Is it the access to colonoscopy or availability of colonoscopy? Is it that you're not comfortable or confident doing colonoscopy or the advanced colonoscopies? Or are there politics at play? And every institution has politics and it gets really dicey sometimes when you talk about who owns colonoscopy at an institution between colorectal surgery and gastroenterology. All right, now let's get into the meat of the bones. Now we kind of set the stage for what we're gonna talk about, why it's important. Now let's get into it. So why is colonoscopy so darn hard? Well, warning, it is. It's really, really hard. Okay, I somehow had this vision when I started practice that at some point after, you know, my 5,000th colonoscopy or something that it would start to feel easy. And by the time I had all gray hair or no hair, um, I go into my day of colonoscopies and basically just kind of like fly through it because, you know, you don't really see the older people sweating quite as much as you do the younger people. So at some point it must feel easy. And then I was very discouraged when I started out and Dave Schetz was still practicing uh, at Leahy. He was just doing colonoscopy for the first couple of years that I was up here. 
And I saw him kind of in a very grumpy mood one day. And I said, how you doing? And he just kind of in his very gruff manner said, I just took an hour and a half to get to the Seacom. And then I kind of like was very surprised and said, I thought by the time I get to your stage in life, that wouldn't happen. And then he just looked at me and just said, colonoscopy never gets easy. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. So when you're feeling discouraged, when you're getting down on yourself, please don't because everybody struggles with this stuff. There is no secret to make every scope seem easy. The trick is to figure out the puzzle. Difficult colonoscopies are like a puzzle. If you have a systematic approach to how to go about it, this will increase your chance of success. So what is it that makes diff some colonoscopies difficult while others, you know, you sail through and, you know, even a, a third year resident could make it to the cecum and feel really good about themselves. Why is it that some of these are difficult? Well, some of these pictures will kind of lead into uh, to, to setting the stage for what are the, some of the challenges that we face. And a lot of these, I'm sure you know, a tortuous colon. Uh, you know, some colons just you know, are, are way longer than they need to be. Um, I'd always say that I would love to do colonoscopies on very straight colons, but only operate on very tortuous colons. If I could choose, pick and choose who I would scope versus operate on, obviously tortuous colons are not fun to scope. Sometimes you'll hit restricted mobility, and this is most often in our world due to diverticular disease, uh, but sometimes you can have pel prior pelvic surgery or prior pelvic radiation that really fixates the colon, makes it very difficult to traverse. Inadequate sedation, so somebody who um, is a, a bit of a drinker or is on, uh, you know, is, is on medications that interact uh, with the moderate sedation that you're using, and that might not be enough. There are comorbidities, so someone who's morbidly obese, someone who has sleep apnea, um, you might encounter a lot of difficulties trying to do a colonoscopy on them. And of course, body habitus. Uh, that cartoon in the middle, uh, if I meet that patient in pre-op in the endo unit, you know you're in for a difficult colonoscopy uh, before you even put the scope inside. You know some people are just going to be really hard. So I like to say that when you're doing a colonoscopy, you really want to set yourself up for success. And there's really three choices that you can make in terms of booking and setting yourself up for the colonoscopy that will either set you up for success or set you up for failure. And that's choosing the right scope, choosing the right sedation, and putting the patient in the proper position. Okay, so we're going to go through those three things and just talk about some of this, the nuances here. So choice of scope. Um, so in general, you might have an option between an adult colonoscope or a pediatric colonoscope. And the techs are always asking me, hey, doc, you want an adult or a PD for this case? So here's my rule of thumb. Everybody is different uh, and has different preferences. I've, I've actually vacillated a little bit on this. I've kind of gone back and forth. Um, I'll use an adult scope for your average male patient or your overweight male patient, especially. Uh, I find the adult scope a little easier to have that extra, uh, that extra purchase, that extra rigidity uh, to use. I, I'd rather have an, uh, an adult scope. Pediatric scopes, if I have a very thin male patient, a very elderly patient, or any female patient, then I automatically use a pediatric scope. Or if they have a history of diverticular disease, um, then I will automatically use a pediatric scope because I've just been stuck in the sigmoid too many times, having a hard time pushing an adult scope through and asking to switch to a PD scope. So I've just come to, if I, if I see they have a history of diverticulitis, even one uncomplicated episode, I always ask for a pediatric scope. There are some specialty scopes that might be available to you, but I very, very rarely ask for these in the endoscopy unit. There are ultra thin scopes. Um, little known fact, a pediatric colonoscope is only about two millimeters thinner than an adult colonoscope. There's not a very big difference. Uh, it's more the flexibility of it um, and just a tiny decrease profile. Um, but there are ultra thin scopes that you can ask for. There's a gastroscope, which is skinnier than a pediatric colonoscope, but obviously a lot shorter. So it's hard to get all the way to the cecum uh, in a, with a gastroscope. Uh, double channel colonoscope, that's really more for specialty. I, that's a whole separate talk um, of something that we do a lot of. Um, and then scopes with adjustable stiffness. I've, I've done colonoscopies on people who had failed colonoscopies on the outside. And the reason for sending them to me at Leahy was that they don't have an adjustable stiffness scope. So they felt that they couldn't get to the cecum and they thought if they could add rigidity to the scope, they would have been able to. So they send them to a place that has that option. Okay, so that's your choice of scope. How about choice of sedation? So in our institution, we do colonoscopies with two different types of sedation. There's moderate sedation, which is Versed and fentanyl. 
Um, that's given by uh, just the nurse in the room and the and the endoscopist with no anesthesiologist. And then there's MAC, which is propofol, and that does require an anesthesiologist or, a, or a CRNA uh, to be in the room. Um, at the various places that I trained, some only did MAC, some only did moderate. Uh, at Leahy, we have a choice of both. We probably do about 80% with moderate and about 20% with MAC. So we have to be selective with who you schedule for MAC. Um, so in general, why would you want one or, over the other? Well, moderate is actually better for a lot of reasons. If I had my choice, I'd rather do moderate. Uh, it's easier to schedule. It's cheaper. And it's easier to do position changes. If you want to move your patient supine, prone, back to supine, back to their side, you can do it easily and safely. Um, the disadvantage is that there's more discomfort. The patient's are awake, and then there's some patients who just uh, the max not adequate. If they if they drink, then you might not be able to get them to that uh, desired level of sedation. Mac obviously is more um, is more expensive. There's more limited uh, availability, and the position changes are more are more hazardous. Uh, putting a patient with propofol supine um, has some risk because they have an unprotected airway, uh, and we have had at least one patient uh, within the last two years at Leahy who aspirated and died uh, during a propofol colonoscopy at our institution uh, from an aspiration event. Um, so th that risk is real. Um, but obviously you can do a lot more. You can put the patient through more uncomfortable situations that you can't with moderate. So choice of position. So pretty much everyone begins in the left lateral position, unless you're in the operating room. If you're in the operating room, they're scoping everybody pretty much uh, in supine split leg. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, and, and that's a learning curve that our fellows need to learn. How do you scope someone in a lithotomy in the split leg position where the scope is trying to fall out of the anus uh, and do that in, a, in not an awkward way? Um, so that's a little harder. But in endoscopy, you want to start in left lateral. Um, some people like Tom Reed, when he was at Leahy, I know always routinely moved every single patient under moderate sedation supine as soon as he got to the splenic flexure. Didn't matter if it was hard or easy, that was just his routine. Um, and then you could always consider prone, which is sort of a last resort, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. All right, I can't get to the cecum, now what? Now this is the meat and bones here. This is, these are those tips and tricks that, um, uh, that I first presented at ASCARS last year that some found helpful. Um, so this is, this is the repeat part of the talk. So a difficult colonoscopy for me, as I said earlier, is like a puzzle. I like to carry around what I call the difficult colonoscopy toolbox. I also think and talk a lot about superheroes in my house. I have two young uh, sons who are very, very into superheroes. So I've adapted that into uh, Batman's utility belt, which my kids really like. Um, but basically these are the tools that I walk around ready to pull out as needed as I encounter situations that I find challenging, okay? So you don't know how much you're gonna need. You don't know what tool you're gonna need for each scope, but as you go through it, you wanna know what's in your toolbox so you know when to pull out the right tool. The bigger your toolbox is, the more tools you have in your toolbox, the more likely you are to be able to manage any situation that you encounter. And so the point of fellowship training and the point of talks like this is to grow your toolbox or put extra notches on your utility belt. Uh, and just file these things away and say, oh, gee, I remember that guy talking about it at that Sunday night thing about doing this or that. Um, and, and you'll never know when something like this is going to help you. So these are some of the, my most commonly used tools uh, in my toolbox, but there's a couple more that we're going to talk about uh, as we go through this. So the first and most common one is loop reduction. Reduce your loop anytime you can. You want to unpretzel the scope, and I'm going to talk about what that means in a minute. You wanna stiffen the scope. I mentioned variable rigidity scopes. Uh, I am a huge advocate for using rigidity to your advantage. That's not uniform. Some people, some attendings that you might learn with will say, don't ever stiffen your scope. There is some increased risk associated with that, um, but if used properly, it can be very, very effective. You wanna ask for pressure, but you wanna ask for pressure at the right time in the right way. And we're gonna come back and cover that in a little bit. You want to move the patient to supine at the right time when it will be helpful for you. And then you want to think about the scope behind you. And I will explain what that means in just a little bit. 
Okay, so the next couple of slides, I'm going to break the, the colon down into quadrants, okay, and talk about what are some of the common things that will help you through each part of the colon. So the little diagram in the upper right, that's your roadmap. So that's telling you where we're talking about. Okay, so trouble in the left colon. So the left colon almost always gives you trouble in a sigmoid. And we know how variable sigmoid colons can be just by how different sigmoid colectomies can be, right? Sometimes uh, you just make a little incision and the sigmoid just pops out at you and it's all the way up in the hepatic flexure uh, and, you, and it just flops right down, right? Now imagine trying to get a scope through that and then trying to get it all the way up to the cecum. No wonder it feels hard, right? Um, and then other people, have sigmoids that are straight of an arrow, and you've got to do some super thorough sigmoid uh, splenic flexure mobilization, open up the lesser sac, hepatic flexure mobilization, Turnbull cutane maneuvers, all this stuff that uh, you really dig deep in your toolbox of how to manage to get reach for the patient that has a very, very straight lack of redundancy colon. So when you have that very redundant sigmoid colon, you really want to do loop reduction. Um, and this is not a new concept. People have been talking about loop reduction for a long time. In general, the best way to reduce your loop is to do a, what we call an alpha turn. And that's diagrammed here. You want to rotate the clock, the, rotate the scope clockwise and then pull back as you're doing it. Clockwise rotation and pull back. You do those moves simultaneously and it'll get that big looped scope to straighten out into a straight scope. What I want to point out on this diagram here is People think about straightening the scope, but what you're not thinking about is that you're actually straightening the colon, okay? The colon is a mobile structure in space. It, it's fixed in a few spots, but it's very mobile in other spots. So a loop forms when the colon is moving, and you're not just fixing your loop of the scope, you're fixing the loop of the colon and straightening it out into a nice straight line that will be easier to push through. Okay, so... Straightening the scope and depretzelifying. This is uh, the concept that I introduced a few slides ago, unpretzeling the colon. So every time you get through the sigmoid colon, almost invariably, you wind up doing a bunch of clockwise rotations as you're going around. And that's just because of the natural contour of the rectosigmoid junction and the sigmoid. If you're going through, you're, you, you tend to clockwise rotate and push in which results in this pretzel effect of the colonoscope that I'm drawing here. If you don't realize that your scope looks like that, then you're gonna have a lot of trouble for the rest of the colonoscopy. So what I do is as soon as I get out of the sigmoid colon and I have the view that you have here on the left, that straight and narrow line going up the descending colon, that's my signal that I'm out of the sigmoid, I'm in the straightaway. Once I get to a stable spot, then I untwist that pretzel. That pretzel is external, by the way. That's outside of the body. If you just pause and take your eyes off of the screen and look down at the scope that's resting on the bed, I can guarantee you that you're gonna see the scope in this kind of a twisted pretzel-like configuration. And then I'll always say to my fellows or the residents, I'll say, okay, depretzelify yourself now, okay? Make that twist straight. And you wanna rotate let the let the world spin around you like you're doing a barrel roll in an airplane. Let the world spin around you as you rotate the scope to get that scope back to a straight orientation. Now, the reason I say you want to wait until you're in the descending cone at a stable spot is that this will often result in you losing some ground. You will often fall backwards while you do that. So you want to make sure you're nice and comfortably in the descending colon so that you don't wind up falling back into that really difficult sigmoid that you just spent 20 minutes trying to get through, okay? So you want to just kind of make sure that you're in a, with your stable fo footing before you do that. At this point, when I'm staring down the straight part of the descending colon, this is when I'll consider adding stiffness now. If I try to push forward and I can feel the scope is bowing outwards and it's, and it's gonna be a little tr tricky, then I'll just automatically switch my rigidity to three right here. And I find that to be very helpful. I say this a lot, a straight scope is a happy scope. You can't straighten the scope too much, okay? The more reductions you do, the more unpretzeling you do, the happier you will be, the happier your scope will be. So a straight scope is a happy scope. All right, so here's the concept that I say, think like a truck driver. So. When you're learning how to do colonoscopy, there's this tendency to be fixated on the colon that's in front of you 
and also the dials that are in your hand. But you forget about everything in between, okay? People pay very little attention or thought to what orientation the scope is in the scope that you can't see. It's that black box of the body, which is why I put that picture at the bottom, the black box of the body. You have to have an idea of what kind of orientation is your scope. I remember when I started out in fellow or as an attending up here, Peter Marcello, who I didn't train with him, but he's taught me a lot about colonoscopy in the five years that I've been working here. Um, he used to say that when he would take a scope away from the fellows, the first thing he does is he just kind of wiggles it around and moves it around a little bit. And then I remember him saying once, usually in about one or two moves, I know exactly what the scope is doing. And I didn't really understand what he meant by that, but now I do. What he's trying to figure out is what is your configuration of the scope in the black box? Do you have a loop? Is it twisted? Are you corkscrewed, et cetera? And I say, think like a truck driver, because you think a truck driver can only stare at the road in front of him? No, the truck driver has got to be thinking about everything between his front tires and his rear tires, because if he doesn't, he's going to sideswipe all kinds of stuff. So you got to think about the entire length of your colonoscope as you're trying to get through and be in touch with what's going on there. You want to loop, redu loop reduce, you want to untwist, uh, you want to constantly push forward and backwards just to get a sense Do you have good one-to-one -one feedback in the scope. And if you don't, you need to pause and figure out what you need to do to get that. All right, so now you've gotten past the splenic flexure and now you're in the transverse colon. So sometimes this is like, easy street. This is like you can lay on the gas and just boom, push right through those triangles of the transverse colon. And before you know it, you're at the next turn and you're like, yeah, life is good. Other times you get those transverse colons that go down to the patient's knee and you're like, where the heck am I? I have no idea where I am. I thought I was in the transverse colon, but now I'm making all kinds of twists and turns. Um, and so this can be really, really challenging. So one of the most helpful tricks for getting across the transverse colon is to switch to supine. So this is where Tom Reed used to do this routinely in every single patient. The second you get past there, switch them to their back. Why? Well, you want to let gravity be your friend. You want to push across the transverse colon and not up into it where gravity is pulling all of those redundant loops and pulling them downwards so that they're sort of hanging on themselves like the vines of a tree. You want to flatten it out so that it all is kind of sitting there, better able to accept the colonoscope. And this diagram just kind of shows the difference in the force vectors for laying in the lateral to keep this position versus laying supine. You want to add stiffness. If you didn't do it in the descending colon, it can definitely help you here. And then you want to ask for pressure, sigmoid pressure specifically. Now, this is the place where it is helpful. I often kind of chuckle to myself when I'm in endoscopy and if I'm struggling to get through, say, the sigmoid colon, because it's really nasty and, there's the, and it's got diverticular disease, there's ticks everywhere, there's twists and turns, and the nurses in endo see that I'm struggling, often a very well-meaning nurse or tech might say, hey, doc, do you want some pressure? Thank you, but no, I don't want pressure. When I'm in the sigmoid colon, giving me sigmoid pressure is not usually going to be very helpful. So you wanna get pressure when it's actually going to be helpful. And this is where it's gonna be helpful. If you're stuck in the transverse and the reason you're stuck is because you keep looping and you can't make forward progress, then ask for sigmoid pressure. And that might be a very helpful uh, place to get it. All right, now I'm gonna introduce you to a concept that I have never seen verbalized or documented before, but it's something that kind of just makes so much sense to me. So people often talk about looping as a bad thing and you want to avoid loops, you want to reduce your loops, et cetera. And that is true. But before a loop becomes a loop, it goes through this period of time where it becomes what I refer to as an inchworm, okay? And what an inchworm is, is it's when you push forward on the scope. If you don't have that forward traction yet, the scope is going to bow out like the, like the back of an inchworm. And it's going to bow out until it pushes against the wall of the colon and then starts giving you that purchase that you need to then move forward. So this can easily turn into a loop if that bow of the back of the inchworm 
twists on itself like a sigmoid volvulus. The second it twists like that, well, then a bow or an inchworm becomes a loop and it's no longer helpful. But in that early stage, that inchworm can be extremely effective. The way you do this is you push in and you usually can feel it in the transverse colon because that's where you have the most flexibility and redundancy. You push in until you feel that scope flexing in your hands. How do you know it's flexing? Because you push, you see the screen's not moving and you can start to feel a little bit of resistance as it pushes up against the colon wall. Then as you get to that apex and it's a feel thing, I can't really tell you exactly when that is, but when you feel like that pressure is at its maximum, right before you feel like it's about to twist on itself and lose it, you want to rotate clockwise and pull back and reduce. And what will often happen is that inchworm is going to straighten itself out, just like an inchworm arches its back and then straightens out and it will push forward. It might sound too good to be true, but try it. I guarantee you, if you try it enough and you get the feel for that inchworm, it will help you. All right, face smushed, no problem, pull back. So I used to hear my attendings in residency and fellowships say this over and over and over. You can't see, pull back. If you can't see, pull back. I used to think of it as a safety thing. I used to think of it as, well, if all you're doing is you're up against the wall, then if you push forward, that's when you're at risk of perforation or tearing the colon. And that's absolutely true. So it is a safety thing, but that's not the only reason. Nobody ever explained this to me until I started thinking about this more, about this, the more theory of colonoscopy. If you're smushed up against the wall, if you're kind of pushing along and you think you kind of have redundancy, you think you kind of have loops, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 what is going on? Why can't I see anything? I can't find the lumen anymore. What has happened is that there is probably an inchworm or a loop behind you that's trying to straighten itself out. Think of uh, a sine wave moving through a long rope. You know, think of holding a long rope uh, that's that's taut, and then you lift your hand up in the air. As that sine wave moves through the scope, it's going to get to the end of the scope, and it's going to smush it up against the side of the wall. So that's what's trying to happen. It's trying to let the energy out of the scope to get back to a straight orientation. And so that's why, if you can't see, pull back. You wanna pull back to give the scope the space that it needs in order to let itself fix the problem and straighten out. A straight scope is a happy scope, once again. And so that's why it's so, so important to pull back. And then if you do, what you're probably gonna find is by the time the lumen just suddenly falls back into place, you've probably gotten a straight scope. You've probably reduced your, your loop reduce your uh, inchworm, and now you're in a position where you can then try to advance and it might actually work. Okay, so now we've gotten across that transverse colon and now we're stuck at that last big turn, that hepatic flexure, the one that is often overlooked and the least practiced uh, turn in all of colonoscopy. Why is it the least practiced turn? Well, I can tell you that it's probably because uh, fellows uh, early in the year and residents who are learning colonoscopy have usually struggled so much getting through the sigmoid, splenic flexure, and transverse that you're usually out of time at this point. And your attending who, you know, has got a colonoscopy every 35 minutes needs to take over uh, to get you to the cecum. And so often what we do because of that is I will often offer to do the first half of a colonoscopy for a fellow. If there's a fellow who hasn't gotten a chance to practice the hepatic flexure, I'll say, all right, let me get you through the sigmoid so you're not wasting your time doing that again. And then let's really focus on practicing hepatic flexure today. Um, and so you might wanna suggest that to your attendings if you find that's happening to you. So hepatic flexures can be one of the hardest turns in all of uh, the colon because the, the angle can be so acute. So uh, uh, Daniel Feingold, who I worked with when I was at Columbia, now he's at Rutgers, um, explain this to me in a way that really made sense to me. And he said, you know, we as surgeons understand that the colon moves. It's not a fixed structure. And so you want to use that to your advantage and actually move the colon on purpose. So he would describe what he would call the hook and pull maneuver. So you basically, what you want to do is you want to pull the hepatic flexure open, almost like you're peeking over the edge and you're just kind of pushing down like this. So you can kind of peek over it. 
So what you do is you, you get a sense of where the, the hepatic flexor is turning. You get into that spot, you maximally deflect the scope down to put that, co that scope in that hook orientation. And then you kind of just scrape like this. You, you pull backwards with the, with the scope in that fully flexed position. And that will open up that flexure. If you get the timing right, as soon as you pull back, you'll kind of see a little bit of space open up and then you let go of that maximal deflection and then your scope is just straight and then you can just slide right in. Kind of similar to the way that we teach getting into the terminal ilium. Kind of a similar kind of a pull and then slide forward kind of a maneuver. So think about that hook and pull for getting around the hepatic flexure. All right, last but not least, that final straightaway, that, that moment when you make that last turn and you see that beautiful ileocecal valve sitting out in the distance and you say, aha, I can see the cecum, I've made it. And then you start pushing and you realize that you're stuck. And that is a very disheartening feeling to finally make it to the right colon, to see the finish line, but then realize that you're in quicksand and you can't actually make it through. So here's a couple of the tools that I use in the right colon. First, decompress. By this point, you've probably hyperinflated the colon by using all this insufflation as you're getting forward. As the first thing that I always do, whether it's an easy scope or a hard scope, as soon as I see the ileocecal valve in the distance, I tap, 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 tap the suction and allow the walls to kind of close in around me. Once that happens, then you're going to find it's going to be much easier. It's very hard to push through a hyperinflated colon. It's always easier to push through a partially inflated colon. So try that. The second, I've only recently recognized the value to this, again, from picking up on something that I heard Peter uh, Marcello say once. You want to move very slowly in the right colon. You want to move slowly and deliberately. Why? Because you have a lot of colon inside that black box right now. And if you move quickly with big movements in the right colon, then you're more likely than not going to get one of those flexion points to give way into a loop, okay? But if you creep forward, if you move slowly and deliberately, then you're more likely to actually make progress without forcing the scope into a loop. If that's not working, and if you're in your supine position and you've added rigidity, then you try position changes, okay? Uh, or sorry, first pressure. First, you wanna try pressure. Um, I'll ask for transverse pressure here, okay? So sigmoid pressure might help you, but trust me when I tell you this, if you're stuck in the right colon next time, try to ask for transverse pressure. Not many people think to do that. Everyone just automatically asks for sigmoid pressure because they figure that's where the redundancy is. But sometimes it's not. And I find that transverse pressure is very helpful uh, if you're stuck in the in the transverse colon. So if you're stuck in the sigmoid, I, I'm sorry, if you're stuck in the transverse, I ask for sigmoid pressure. If you're stuck in the ascending, I ask for transverse pressure. If you're still stuck, I'll ask for both. And this is where uh, I'll, you need, you know, four hands um, and I'll ask for people to push in both parts. And it's not very often that I have to do that. And it's not very often that that doesn't work. It's, un, it's, it's not something you want to make a habit of because it won't make you the most popular person in endoscopy um, to be asking for two people in the room to be adding pressure for you. But it is one of those tools, one of those not super used tools, uh, but one of those tools in the box that I do turn to occasionally. All right. So in the time remaining, let's talk about how colonoscopy can fit in your practice. So. There's a couple of key principles here that I think should govern how you set up your practice. And everyone's situation is gonna be different. Not everyone's at a large academic center. A lot of people are in private practice. A lot of people are in a community setting. A lot of people, you know, finances governs everything. So it's easy for me to say some of this stuff at an institution where, you know, I got a lot of support from the hospital and, and these things are here. But there are principles that I think can apply to any practice location in the country. So we are big believers in this statement that we say all the time at Leahy, what percentage of colorectal surgery should have a CO2 colonoscope available? 100%. We should always have a scope available. We don't use it 100% of the time, um, but it, it should always be available. 
gastroenterologists should not have the last say over where you cut, okay? If you think about this, if you're not able to do your own colonoscopy, you're making all of your decisions on where to go, where to cut, based on a gastroenterologist, based on where they say a lesion was or where they say they placed a tattoo or where they say the colon looked normal uh, and, and the colitis started or stopped. This, these are not decisions that they should be making for you. You should really be able to have a say in it yourself and you should be able to look at yourself. And then there's this, uh, this quote that I took from Peter Marcello. Peter Marcello took from Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. Our fellows, anyone who's come through Leahy knows that this is said on a daily basis, trust but verify. Always look for yourself. So what does that mean? How do we actually make these principles come to life? Well, here's the things that you have to ask for. And you have to think to yourself in your practice or in your job negotiations, because many of you are going to be negotiating in the next couple of months. These are the things you need to ask about or ask for. There should be a CO2 colonoscope available in every OR. The results of my very non-scientific su survey um, said that we're doing pretty well on this, but clearly that's not universal yet. We should have flexible sigmoidoscopies in clinic. I'm going to show you some of the value in having that available. There should be dedicated endoscopy block owned by colorectal surgeons that you can use for your own patients. And then you may also want to consider joining the general colonoscopy screening pool. Not all colon colorectal surgeons do that. I do. I think it's very valuable, and you may want to consider that uh, for reasons we'll talk about. All right, so let's talk about office flexible sigmoidoscopies for a minute, because uh, clearly this is not universally available. I'd say we're probably in the minority. But here's just a couple of examples of how I use colonoscopy in our clinic, basically every single clinic session. Um, this is just a, a partial list um, that I put together. So, um, and there's two pages here, okay? So first, new rectal cancer. You know, rigid, rigid sigmoidoscopes are antiquated. Let's just be honest here. You know, to, to puffing some air into the rectum and looking into a tube to confirm what a cancer looks like and where it is, is just not where we should be in 2022. We should be doing better. So this is a patient that I saw on Friday, just this past Friday, extremely symptomatic from his cancer, sounded obstructed, looked partially obstructed, uh, on his CAT scan. And I wanted to really know, geez, you know, how close is he to a malignant large bowel obstruction? So I scoped to myself. I scope every rectal cancer patient. But in this one, it was really helpful for me to understand just how close he was from a complete large bowel obstruction. This patient is being admitted tomorrow for me to divert him uh, with a lap colostomy before starting TNT. Um, and if I didn't have that flex scope available, I may not have known how much of his symptoms are just from tenesmus or how close he is to actually being obstructed. Watch and wait. You cannot offer watch and wait to your rectal cancer patients if you don't have a uh, good ability to do office-based flex sig. You need the, one of the most critical things in watch and wait protocols is a flexible endoscopy every four months uh, to observe the tumor. And if you're, you're not going to bring a patient to the endoscopy unit under sedation every four months for, for you know, two years and then three years after that, that's a lot of procedures. If you have it in your office, it's no big deal. It's just like coming in and just doing a rectal exam. It's, it's a piece of cake. It's, it's two minutes long. So that, pay, that uh, picture on the bottom right is a real patient of mine who entered watch and wait with me in 2018. He's now four years into his surveillance. And that picture on the right was from uh, about a month ago when I last saw him for a surveillance flex sig. Um, so I've been seeing him every four months. Now he's on the six month time because he's at four years out. Um, but he's got one more year of me doing this before uh, we graduate him. Um, and then uh, last, surveillance after advanced removal of rectal polyps. So I do a lot of transrectal excisions of tumors, either transanal or uh, robotic TAMIS. Uh, my partners do TAMS. Regardless of what you do, it's really nice if you can just survey your patients in the office. Um, the bottom left is a, is a patient that I did earlier this year. She had a gigantic sessile laterally spreading polyp that was circumferential in the distal rectum. So I did a circumferential mucosal resection and then surveyed her on flex sig on the right. At three months post-op, I found that little nodule along the scar uh, that I realized was some residual polyp. And so I brought her back for a re-excision last month and now she's doing fine. Um, if I didn't have that flex sig available, I may not have done a three month flex sig and I may not have seen that. So there's more things we do. Um, 
evaluate rectal polyp burden and FAP. So these pictures on the top right, this is the, this is the most recent J pouch that I did last month. Uh, this is a 21-year-old with FAP. When I first met her, I did a flex sig to see if she had rectal sparing FAP uh, and would be a potential candidate for an iliorectal. She didn't. That was a, a big polyp sitting in her rectum. So I did a J pouch. And then she came in a few weeks post-op with abdominal pain, malaise, and I was worried about a leak. So we brought her to the clinic and I did a pouchoscopy. So here's a picture of her J pouch uh, that I did in the clinic, not an endoscopy. Um, but we do this all the time. If we have a concern of our anastomosis, fresh post-op, just bring them to clinic. Let's just do a flex sig. Um, health of the rectum. So on Friday, one of the other new patients that I saw was a guy with colitis, left-sided colitis, who didn't want to lose his rectum. So he's asking about an iliorectal. And I almost never offer that, but I said to him, I was like, look, let me look at what your rectum looks like and let's see if it's even an option. So I put the scope in and that's what his rectum looked like. It looked like dog meat. And I said, no, there's no way you can get an iliorectal. So if we're operating, we're doing a total proctal colectomy. Um, but he could actually look at it himself when he's wide awake. And as soon as he looked in, he went, holy crap. Um, and he understood immediately why he couldn't get what he was asking for. Uh, here's a patient with a fresh post-op anastomotic bleed. So this was last month. Uh, this patient came back in. Um, I didn't think she was bleeding anymore. Um, so I just want to get a look. So rather than booking her for endoscopy, uh, I just brought her over to clinic and I did this and I saw this big clot sitting on my anastomosis, but there was no active bleeding. So I didn't do anything. We watched her for two days. She didn't bleed again. She went home, saved her a trip to endoscopy. How about intraoperative colonoscopy? So we use intraoperative colonoscopy a ton. So basically everything that I just mentioned that we do in the office uh, we can do in the operating room. So, you know, if you ever, if you're bringing someone back who you know does have a leak, it always starts with the scope. Every single anal rectal case, I start with the scope, at least a partial scope, just to make sure the rectum doesn't have rip roaring proctitis before I remove a hemorrhoid. Um, so, all of those things you can do in the OR, plus a couple of other things. Some of these are obvious intraoperative tumor verification. So, think back to that first example I gave you. So that tumor that was reportedly just distal to the splenic flexure at 65 centimeters, um, I couldn't find the tattoo. So no problem, pause, put the scope in, did an intraoperative colonoscopy because the scope was right there, ready to go. And turns out it was at the hepatic flexure. Whoops. And I saw the measly little tattoo. It was tattooed in one spot sitting right over the mesentery. So that's why I couldn't see the tattoo. So I re-tattooed it in three quadrants, which is what we usually do, distal to the lesion, and then sure as, de sure as anything, there it was right at the hepatic flexure. So I switched from a left colectomy to a right colectomy in that patient. And again, that was with my favorite gastroenterologist. So trust, but verify, always. Um, assessment of the health of the distal margin. So that patient, that other patient who had quiescent colitis for 15 years, who had inflammation from descending to the cecum, but a normal sigmoid and rectum. Um, my plan, because of this kind of questionable history, is to bring them for a subtotal colectomy and do an iliosigmoid anastomosis. But you better believe I'm gonna have a scope intraoperatively and we're gonna scope that rectum and sigmoid and make sure that the rectum and sigmoid are in fact normal. Um, and then we'll make sure that we can test our anastomosis. And then combined endoscopic laparoscopic cases. So this is some higher level stuff. Not every facility is able to do this. We are very fortunate. We have two operating rooms, now about to be three operating rooms at Leahy that are equipped with uh, CO2 force-fed uh, towers that allow us to do simultaneous colonoscopy with CO2 insufflation and laparoscopy with CO2 insufflation. Um, and this is one of my cases from earlier this year. Um, and this is us removing a polyp growing into the appendiceal orifice. I get a lot of these referrals. Um, and our way of doing that is we do these extended appendectomies. It should be more sophisticated than just take a chunk of the appendix plus a little bit of cecum and hope you got it. We like to do it a little bit more sophisticated. So what we do is we mobilize the appendix all the way down to the base. Right when we're ready to staple, right before we do that, I stop. And then I go between the legs. So that's me between the legs of the patient. And that's, I can't tell who that is uh, from this picture. I'm sorry, who is, I'm not giving credit to whoever it is, but that's probably one of our fellows or, or chief residents um, stays at the bedside doing the laparoscopy. I get the scope all the way over. 
And then the leftmost screen is the internal view of colonoscopy that we're looking at the appendiceal orifice there. And then the two screens on the right are the laparoscopic view. And we bring the screens right next to each other so that it's like picture in picture, uh, colonoscopy and laparoscopy. Uh, the robot has the ability to do this with Tile Pro. Um, so hopefully you guys have seen how that works. It's a great, great feature of the robot. We use it all the time in our case for basically the same exact thing, except the fellow stays over at the console and then I'll go do the flex sig. Um, I'll do that. We just did that the other day when we did a rectopexy. Um, I always flex sig at the end to make sure that we didn't suture the rectum closed. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll, we'll have that side-by-side -side picture. But with laparoscopy, it's a little bit clunkier, but you can do the same thing. So just to think about how much do I actually use colonoscopy in my practice? Well, this is how my day, how my week is set up. Um, and so every day where I have a colonoscope in my hand um, has a little diagram next to it. So Monday is my endoscopy day. I, get, I have a full day of block time in, the, in endo. I usually do somewhere between 10 and 13 colonoscopies uh, per, per day, about five or six in the morning and about five or six in the afternoon. Tuesday and Wednesday are my OR days. So that's where every single case, every single time we have a colonoscope available. I also do a fair amount of, of advanced endoscopy. So we do uh, uh, EMRs, we do combined endoscopic laparoscopic. So obviously you gotta have scopes available, ready to go for that. So Tuesday and Wednesday, there's always a scope involved. Thursday is usually my admin day, which means it's my extra clinic day. And then also uh, two days a month, I do half a day of endo up in our satellite, up in Peabody. So I'm scoping those days. The extra clinic, I usually see my rectal cancers or some of those consults that I know take extra time. Um, so those always get flex SIGs uh, in those kinds of consults that take longer. And then Friday is my clinic day. And I'd say on a typical clinic session where I see about 20 patients, we'll do about five to eight flex SIGs in that session. So about 20% of the patients that we see in the office get a flex SIG for any one of the reasons that I may have mentioned before. So what are some of the barriers here? So what might be holding you back? Well, obviously finances are a big part of this. Um, it all comes down to money. And when hospitals are really struggling to just keep their doors open and their staffing up to reasonable levels, you know, asking for some of this stuff that carry big price tags may not be that easy. Your infrastructure may not support doing as much flexible sigmoidoscopies in your clinic. We are really lucky at Leahy because we are all under one roof. Our clinic sits in the main building of the hospital, uh, four floors directly above our endoscopy unit and four floors directly above our ORs. So our medical assistants are just very easily, easily able to just ride up and down the elevator and bring the scopes down to central sterile uh, to the endoscopy processing center to get our scopes clean. Um, if we were scoping in, a, in an office that didn't have that infrastructure already in place, well, then it's not so easy. Um, so that is something that is maybe insurmountable to some clinic settings. But let's say you're starting out as the first colorectal surgeon in your location, and they're trying to talk to you about where your clinic will be. You may have the opportunity to say, hey, is there a clinic space that's in the building? If so, can I use it? Because then I can do flex SIGs there, and then it'll be easier to clean the scopes. That will show your administrators that, hey, you're actually thinking this through uh, from a process standpoint, and it actually might be feasible. Politics with gastroenterology are a big one. Um, you know, our culture at my institution is really favorable. Um, we are at equal footing with, with GI, and we really kind of have a, have a uh, stake in advanced endoscopy too. Our advanced endoscopists kind of stick to upper GI and leave the colons to us. Um, that's not the way everywhere. So, but the way I would recommend you approach that is if you are in an institution that, that GI is very reluctant to let you scope, the way that I would approach it is I would ask, I would ask to meet with the chief of GI and say, how many colonoscopies uh, are performed by your group per year? And then ask how, what's the average wait time from placement of order to a routine colonoscopy. And most people will say somewhere between two and four months and most of the time. And then you can say, well, maybe I can help you with that. Um, do your current gastroenterologists feel overwhelmed by the number of routine scopes? I'd be happy to do some routine scopes in my practice to offload some of that burden from your, from your gastroenterologist. 
and come at it from that perspective so that you're being viewed as a helper, not as a threat. And that's how we do it at Leahy. Um, we have a high enough volume that they love that we can do scopes. Um, and the more people spreading the, the wealth of the, of the general colonoscopy pool, the better. And that's how I would recommend you go about that. Limited endo block time is a big deal. I know where I did my residency, that was a huge issue. Um, and it's a bit of an issue at Leahy, but it, we're just so embedded in the culture that we all own our own block time. Um, that's just, again, ties in with politics a bit. It might take some negotiating. So in conclusion, colonoscopy is hard. Don't beat yourself up over it. Don't be despondent. I didn't start routine hit, routinely hitting the cecum until about May of my fellowship year. Um, and it wasn't until I was about two years in practice where I started feeling like I really hit my stride with colonoscopy. This is one of the hardest technical things that we do. Um, and and just, just keep reminding yourself that as, as on your dark days. Um, you wanna set yourself up for success, pick the right scope, use the right sedation, put the patient in the right position. Start building your toolkit for how to manage difficult problems. The more tools you have in there, the better equipped you will be. A straight scope is a happy scope, so reduce early and reduce often. And start petitioning your hospital to get 24-7 access to a CO2 colonoscope in the OR. Push for flexible sigmoidoscopy in your clinic if you can. And try to convince your administration and your GI colleagues that everyone will benefit if you have full access to colonoscopy. It will give better care to your patients and you will be better able to handle problems in a cost-effective way and avoid unnecessary trips to endoscopy or the OR. I'd like to thank Peter Marcello for providing some of the pictures that you saw uh, during the technical parts of the uh, of the talk today. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for such a great talk and for adding that second half. I think lots of really useful applications as we go forward and we kind of are starting to all hunt for jobs. Um, we've got some questions in the chat. Matt Bobel asked, uh, in residency, he saw flex sig being done without sedation. Is that how you do it in your clinic? Absolutely. Yep. And then, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, in the clinic, we, we never give sedation in the clinic. Um, I'd say 99% uh, of the patients that we flex are able to tolerate it just fine. Um, the way I, the way I tell them is I say it takes about 30 seconds to do. And then when I, when I put the scope in, I say, okay, this is going to feel like my finger. And then I say, okay, now I need to fill up your rectum with air. This is going to make you feel like you have to poop, but don't worry. That will go away as soon as I take the air out. And then as I talk through them, as I talk them through that, I've already done most of the flex sig. And then by the time I actually finish looking at what I'm looking, I'm suctioning out the air and I'm out. Yeah. It, that's a skill. And that's something, you know, practice being slick with getting the scope in and finding the rectum quickly and efficiently. Practice when your patients are sedated so that you can start doing it on wide awake patients um, without futzing around. Um, and then he also wanted to know when you were first starting your practice, how often did you ask a senior partner or a GI colleague or, you know, especially with kind of more advanced things, if you feel like there's a difficult polyp, you know, how often are you kind of asking for help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. Um, so the answer is um, not super often in colonoscopy, but often enough. Um, I definitely ordered a lot more virtual colonoscopies in my first two years than I do now. Um, and there's no shame in that, you know, if you can't get to the colon, do no harm, get a virtual, bring them back another time, you know, try again another day. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, you know, there's, there's absolutely no shame. Our junior partners have called me in, uh, to help them through a difficult colon. One thing that we do have, we have a rule at Leahy, which is that no fellows are allowed to scope with a partner, with a new attending in their first year. And that was a hard rule um, because that, that Peter Marcello invoked and, and it worked well for me. And then John Abelson, Julia Sridharides, who you might know, they, they both started after me. Um, and it really was helpful for us um, because what you, you want to get your feet under you as an attending. You don't want to be having the added stress of trying to talk a fellow through a colonoscopy. So I would yeah. strongly recommend that you have a similar rule uh, in your first year of practice. Um, Lindsay Skeets wants to know, do you routinely intubate your TI and retroflex or do this selectively? Great question. So early on, 
I intubated the TI in every single patient. The only reason I did it was to practice. I wanted to get so good at intubating the TI that I could do it on every patient every time I tried. That way, when it's really important, I can do it. But I no longer routinely intubate the TI. If I have no reason to do it, other than for teaching purposes, I don't do it. But every once in a while, I'll have you know a 23-year-old female patient with bloody diarrhea um, that I'm scoping. And if you don't intubate the TI and prove that their TI looks normal, you did not do a complete colonoscopy on that patient. So I would strongly recommend that early on in your practice, you practice doing it every single time um, so that you have the ability to do it selectively when you need to. Um, I'd say similar for retroflexion. So Dave Schatz never retroflexed. Okay, and he was pretty darn good and endoscopist, but he would say, there is nothing that I can't see in the rectum looking forwards if you just are, are able to kind of like move the, like pan around, you know, adequately. And we've all seen or heard of perforations that can happen. So my rule with retroflexion is I try to retroflex once per patient. If I try once and if I do it and I can't get it, like, you know, it doesn't flip or it seems like the rectum's too narrow. I don't try again. I say, okay, well, this one's not going to get a retroflexion. And, and I, don't, I don't lose sleep over it. I don't overtry. Anyone who's had an LAR, obviously no retroflexion. Anyone who's had radiation, no retroflexion. Um, but otherwise, I think it's worth doing. Um, and then I actually had two questions. Do you use stiffness as like a zero or a three? Or do you use the in-between stiffness modes? Yeah, I tend to it, I tend to do all or nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I don't know. I, maybe I should try in between and see how it works. But um, to me, it's either like you have the stiffness on, or you or you don't. Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, I'm like super fascinated by this inchworm concept because I've never heard anyone communicate it. But I'm wondering if like the corollary to that, right, is like I've done scopes and the tinnings are like pushed through the loop, and then you like straighten it. Is that your inchworm, right? It's like the loop is bowing. So when they say push through the loop, I'm going to venture a guess to say we're talking about the same thing. Because if you really have a loop, the, some loops you cannot push through mm -hmm. uh, because they just get, there's so much laxity there that it's just like a volvulus that'll just keep, you're making, you're just making a bigger and bigger O, right? Um, until eventually you rip something. Um, so pushing through the loop sometimes will not work, but if you can push through the loop, we're probably describing the same phenomenon of an incomplete loop mm -hmm. where the scope's flexed like this, but not mm -hmm. fully torsed. I think we're just, we're just using the same thing. The other analogy that I like to use is it's sort of like cracking a whip uh, mm -hmm. or like that sine wave as it's going through the end mm -hmm. of the scope. So as, as the scope's bowed like this, and then when you pull back, it's going to lurch the scope forward. It's not just going to straighten you out, but you're going to be like, holy crap, I'm like flying forward if you get it right. It's the coolest thing once you get the hang, the hang of it. Um, and then you, the, the next part of it is to time it. This is the really fancy stuff. Mike Cleats, who's hopefully I hasn't fallen asleep yet, um, but Mike has seen me try to teach him this. When you combine the inchworm with the hook pull, that's where you really start getting into the high level stuff because you'll get to this really hard point of the hepatic flexure. And if you can time your inchworm when you've opened up the hepatic flexure and then you pull your hand back just at the right moment and then the scope just flings itself forward and you're in the cecum. Um, and, uh, and then it, that's when the fellows are like, oh my God, what, what the heck just happened there? <laughs> but that's all it is, is it's just timing it right. And that's just practice. Uh, Mike Pleats has noted in the chat, he is still here. <laughs> yeah, I um, and then PI wanted to know, you know, the example scenarios that you gave, if you could briefly discuss your approach for the second and third. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, the second was, uh, yeah, so the, the IBD patient, I kind of mentioned. So for that patient who had this colitis from descending to cecum with a five centimeter mass, so the, the reason for referral to me was to consider advanced endoscopic removal of the polyp because it was quote unquote, not proven cancerous yet. So um, 
I had to shoot that down right away, that there is no option for removing a five centimeter cecal mass with intramucosal adenocarcinoma in the background of moderate to severe colitis. Don't ever do that. So that was the first part of my discussion with the patient is that he needed a resection. The question then became, you know, do we put him on a biologic and try to cool down the rest of the colitis because he's on no medication? Or, um, or do you just take out the whole colon? Or do you assume this is ulcerative colitis and really the rectum's probably not really normal and he needs a total proctal colectomy because this is cancer? Um, I would love to pull the audience, but in the interest of time, since we're already over, I'll, I'll just tell you my thoughts is I don't think this is behaving like true UC. I think mean, this is more of a Crohn's colitis picture um, with skip lesions. So we're planning a subtotal colectomy with ileosigmoid and astomosis. And Anna Kata has the pleasure of getting to do that one with me in a couple of weeks because now she's on my service. Um, and so stay then, tuned, Anna. <laughs> and then we have a question from Sir John. Dr. Chen wants to know when have you ever decided to abort a colonoscopy? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, oh, real quick, you asked about the second, the, the third the, scenario also oh, yeah, the, with many polyps. So that was an interesting one. So actually, I simplified it. In real life, what happened was I put in a colonoscope, I found a five centimeter polyp in the rectum. I did a, a hot snare polypectomy and there was a system malfunction and I cut across this one centimeter base and the heat did not transmit. It wound up, we wound up realizing there was a defect in the cord um, that connected the, uh, the cautery. So I cut across this polyp and got pulsatile bleeding that I could not stop. And so we wound up going emergently over to the OR where uh, I was able to actually, it was low enough in the rectum that I reached it transanally and just put in a couple of stitches and got control of the bleeding. So I aborted that colonoscopy, but I had gotten the polyp off and it was just a tubular villus adenoma, no dysplasia or cancer. Um, then a month later, I brought him back and, and did the rest of his colonoscopy where I found those other polyps, um, was not prepared to do an EMR at that time. So I wound up just biopsying them and putting tattoo distal to that transverse colon polyp so that if I needed to do an extended right colectomy, I could. Then I brought him back and I did a dedicated double channel EMR in the OR where we removed all three of those big polyps with double channel EMR technique. And that, Anna, I think you did with me, right? Uh, about two weeks ago, I think. Or maybe it was Mike, I can't remember. But one of them just did that a couple of weeks ago and he did well. Um, yeah, it was Anna. Yeah. Um, so what was your, your next question? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, Dr. Chen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So do no harm. Right? <clears throat> so if ever you are stuck and you're not making progress, uh, so just abort. So for me, the most common scenario for when I abort is when I hit a, a nasty diverticular sigmoid colon. There are some sigmoid colons that you, that you get into and it's like hitting a brick wall. Um, and we know these patients because we operate on them, right? They're the ones that, that you bring for sigmoid colectomy and you're like, oh my God, this thing is like concrete um, and you're chiseling these colons out. Well, we know what those patients can look like, but gastroenterologists don't really understand how bad sigmoid colons can really get. So they'll, they'll really sweat it out and try to get through these nasty sigmoids and then wind up referring them to you emergently thinking that they have a stricture or that they're obstructed, they're really not. It's just there are some colons that from diverticular disease just become like concrete. They are, they're not clinically obstructed, but they're not going to, to open up enough to accommodate a scope. And that's a feel thing. And I will sometimes just get to that point in a, in a scope and I'm like, all right, this is concrete. I'm not giving glucagon. I'm not giving Benadryl. I'm not switching to an ultra thin scope. I'm not doing all that nonsense. This patient needs a sigmoidectomy. And I'll just abort and then I'll bring them. I'll just either this is a pre-op scope and they're already scheduled for surgery or I'm scoping them because I've seen them for a consult and they're still on the fence. And I'll say, look, your sigmoid is rotten. We could try again in six months. Um, we could get a virtual, but really you just need an operation. And then I'll bring them for surgery and then do a full colonoscopy postoperatively. So that's probably the most common reason we're all just abort. But again, yeah. Anytime you're not comfortable, do no harm. You don't want to perforate a patient. Don't try to be a hero. There's, there's no shame in being like, look, I know how much I can do safely. And I got beyond that. And I, the last thing I wanted to do is perforate you. Your patients will appreciate it. 
Well, thank you so much. I think that is all the questions that we have. We really appreciate your time um, and uh, have a great evening, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you so much again for the invitation.